Well, we're going to continue our study through Philippians, uh, the Paul's letter to the Philippian church. The series is called Life Worthy because I feel like that's the theme that Paul was writing to the Philippian church, like live a life worthy of the gospel. As followers of Jesus, we are people of grace through faith. And if that is so, then why do we always, why do we tend to make following Jesus so much more complicated than it needs to be? You know, we, we, we love to create more religious hoops for ourselves to jump through and everybody else that we encounter to jump through. And this has gone on from the beginning. You know, that Jesus even called out the religious leaders for saying you, you're, you're more concerned about your, your own traditions than you are about God himself. And you heap these burdens on people's shoulders that you're not even willing to lift a finger to help them with. And even after Jesus ascended back into heaven, after he rose from the dead, when the church had started, it didn't take long for the first controversy to arise because you had Jewish Christians who had given their life to Jesus, believing that he was the Messiah. And now we're having to deal with Gentiles coming in, and they're like, wait a minute, Gentiles aren't circumcised. And so now they're giving the Gentiles a hard time saying, hey, you want to follow Jesus, you got to be circumcised. Again, creating more religious hoops for them to jump through. And I, th- I don't think much has changed in our day and age. People still want to trust the flesh. In other words, they want to trust what they can see, taste, touch, smell. Because seeing is believing. And for a lot of people in the material world, this is all there is. But even, and even Christians, I think, we fall into this trap. We share the gospel, with them, but then we heap heavy burdens upon people. Making them jump through the religious hoops we've created in order to, almost to have them prove to us that they're really a Christian. And what do they have to prove to us? I don't, I don't feel like anybody has to prove anything to me. I'm, I'm not God. I don't want to be. He's got way too much. He's way too busy. I don't want to be him. We look for ways to, quote, unquote, circumcise the flesh so that we can brag about all the new converts we've made. But the problem with boasting in the flesh is that, I think as we know and as we've experienced, it leads nowhere. It's hopeless. You want to boast in the flesh, okay, great, but what's going to happen at the end? You can have the greatest resume in the world, and at the end of the day, when, when your life is over, what does that mean? You can't take your resume with you and show it to Jesus and say, look at my resume. Because deep down inside, we, we all know that we need something greater than ourselves. Because we, we can look around, and if we're really being honest with ourselves, we can look around and say, there's nothing in this life that promises hope for eternity. Nothing. Not one thing. We need something that has just transcended the flesh to give us hope beyond what we can only see, taste, touch, and smell. In this next section of Philippians, Paul encouraged the Philippian church to not boast in the flesh, but completely trust in Jesus. So ask yourself this today as we read through this passage. Do I trust more in Jesus or the flesh? Or do I trust more in Jesus or the flesh? So we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. You can follow along with interactive sermon notes. On, uh, if you go to your smartphones and type in uh, sermons.church, your search engine, and you can type in, when you find that, you can type in Chumps Bible Church and there are interactive sermon notes there with scripture references. <laughs> but the first thing we'll look at is this idea of lose to gain. Lose to gain. So in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, this is what Paul says to the uh, Philippian church. And remember, keep in mind where Paul is trying to get them to see that it, don't focus on the flesh, focus on something beyond that. So he says this in verse 1, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, 
For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and have put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So, in a few of his letters, Paul had to deal with some false teachers. Here he calls them dogs. <laughs> he doesn't have kind words for them. But it was these false teachers that called Judaizers, and they would come in, these Jews who actually didn't believe in Jesus, but they would tell these Gentiles and say, oh, you want to follow Jesus, then you've got to be circumcised. And all they want to do is just boast in their flesh. They say, look, i got another, got another one circumcised. got another ten circumcised. That's all they wanted to do. There were these Jews who didn't get the memo from the Jerusalem Council that you read about in Acts 15. Because Paul and Barnabas came from the mission field amongst the Gentiles, sharing about all these Gentiles who were coming to Christ. But the problem was the Jews in Jerusalem and some other Jews were saying, well, they got to be circumcised. they got to go through the religious hoops. If they don't go through the religious hoops, then they're not really Jewish. And they weren't understanding that Jesus fulfilled the law. We're part of the new covenant. So the Jerusalem council had to get together. Peter and the other apostles, they had to discuss this. And they finally decided, look, look, Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. That's not what it's about. It's not about circumcision of the flesh. It's about circumcision of the heart. And if you read through the Old Testament, that's what it was about too. Peter challenged those gathered for the Jerusalem Council to, put, to stop putting heavy yokes upon the necks of those Gentiles who are coming to faith in Christ. And, Jared, and, and, and Peter wasn't speaking from some kind of new idea he came up with. He had seen, because of Christ, because his eyes were open now, they're all going back to the scriptures they grew up with and seeing it in new ways, seeing it through the lens of Jesus. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, this is what the prophet Jeremiah, and remember Jeremiah is prophesying during a time where no one actually wants to listen to him whatsoever. Imagine having that calling upon your life. God says, okay, I want you to be a prophet. I want you to go to your people, and guess what? None of them are going to listen to you. You're probably not going to have any friends. It's actually going to be a pretty lonely experience. But I need you to do it. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, this is what God says to the prophet. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, No, Lord, because they will know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. So even the prophet Jeremiah, as he's, he's saying, Look, here's the message God has told us. There will come a day where God will say, I'm going to be done with the old covenant because you guys broke that anyway. And I'm going to give you a new covenant where I write my law upon your minds and upon your hearts. It's going to be inside here. You're not going to have to worry about stone tablets anymore and all this outward stuff. It's going to be in here. So when Peter stands up in the Jerusalem Council, he's standing on a foundation of what God had told the prophet Jeremiah and what God had told all the other prophets and great men of the past too. It's not about the works of the flesh. It's about putting 
putting your faith in God is about circumcising your heart. It's about God circumcising your heart. Look what Paul says in Romans 2, 25 through 29. He's writing to the Roman church, you know, a church composed of Gentiles. And there's some Jews there as well. But he says this in verses 25 through 29. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So Paul is basically saying, you want to be circumcised, great. Well, if you're going to be circumcised, guess what? You've got to follow the law. And if you break any, even one part of the law, it's going to be like you, you didn't even get circumcised to begin with. So, good luck. In verse 26, he says this, So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. So Paul is even saying to the Jews in that church, like, look, you want to follow the law and you want to worry about circumcision? Well, guess what? You break the law, but you got these other Gentiles who are not circumcised who are following the law. They're better off than you. They're better off. Verse 28, a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. Notice that capital S there. Not your spirit, the Holy Spirit. Not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. And this is not something that Paul understood even, even in the early stages of his life. When he was boasting, going back to that Philippians passage we read, he was boasting about, it's like, look, if, I can, if anybody's going to boast, let me boast. Here was my resume. I was circumcised on the eighth day, according to Jewish law. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin. According to the law, I was a Pharisee, meaning he knew the law very, very well. And he followed it to a T. But guess what? He realized when he encountered Jesus, all he was doing was following the law on the outside. It wasn't in here. He was circumcised on the outside, but not in here. What the Jews lost sight of over the centuries was that physical circumcision was not what made you part of God's covenant people. It was the circumcision of the heart. Look at Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. This is what Paul says a couple chapters over from what we just read. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? He's talking about circumcision. What did he discover? What did he figure out? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. <coughs> Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Here's where Paul is going to get to the point of the matter. Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, and he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to him, to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Let me give you a modern day example so we can understand this a little bit better. You can't, you can't come to church and say, oh, I want to be baptized and get baptized and think you're a Christian if it's not here. Baptism doesn't save you. That water does not save you. 
That water is an outward sign of the inner change that's in here. Should you be baptized? Yeah. So you can share with everybody else and say, I am a follower of Jesus now. You don't become a follower of Jesus when you get dunked in the water. You become a follower of Jesus before you even get in the water. So when Paul says, look, I got some news for you, my fellow Jewish people. Abraham was considered righteous before God because he believed in God, not because he got circumcised. The circumcision happened after. It's like, you want to be like your father Abraham? Then believe in the one that God sent. Believe by faith. Going back to that passage in Philippians when Paul did all his boasting. Notice how, the, notice how he shifts gears after he gives out his great resume. He shifts gears because he lists all those accolades, but then he goes, then he says this, but then I figured out that they're all garbage. All that stuff I thought was great. All that stuff I thought was awesome. I met Jesus and I, I, I realized it's all hot garbage. What Paul once thought was prized and highly valued immediately turned to rubbish the moment he met Christ. He could, I think he could relate to those false teachers who were stuck on the works of the flesh for justification because he was there at one point. But then he was trying, then now he's like, guys, you got to listen. That's not going to get you there. That's not going to save you. You got to realize that all that stuff you think is awesome and great in this world, you think all this stuff that is going to justify you is garbage if it's not Jesus. Because it is Christ and Christ alone. Here is what the world promises us. Fulfilled life, success, satisfaction, peace, comfort, etc. Guess how many of those promises the world actually delivers upon? Zero. Jesus promises us life, peace, grace, forgiveness, righteousness. The list goes on and on and on. And guess how many Jesus fulfills? All of them. For you math people, do the math. Everything in this world added together equals zero. Everything. Add it all up, it equals zero. Jesus alone equals everything. Paul realized this. And he was more than willing to give up the pursuit of having a righteousness of his own that comes from the law. Because I think in that moment, I think Paul was even thinking about this beforehand. He's like, what? deep down, I think Paul was wrestling with this, going, why am I doing this? This is exhausting. Think about it. We've all been there when we tried to save ourselves. How much fun was that? It was exhausting. It's tiring. And then you meet Jesus and he goes, quit trying so hard. And you're like, oh, thank you. It's a relief. You're like, oh, now I don't have to save myself. You can do it all for me. Are we willing to lose it all for the sake of Christ? Do we see everything in our lives as garbage compared to Christ? <clears throat> when we lose it all, we gain everything because we gain Christ. The second thing I want to look at this morning is that we need to press on. So if we've realized that everything apart from Jesus is garbage and Jesus is everything, then we need to press on. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, this is what Paul writes, continues to write. And he says this, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. 
Instead of focusing on what he had accomplished, which he used to do, he focused, Paul focused on what was ahead. His new goal in life, after surrendering to Jesus, was to press on toward the goal of the upward call of Christ Jesus. And the language that Paul used here was usually find was usually found in describing athletic competitions or training. The word for straining was particularly graphic in that it implied straining muscles, clear focus, and unwavering determinations that athletes have in competition. So Paul is saying, let's strain. I'm going to strain towards what is ahead. I'm going to just try to be as hyper-focused as I can to fix my eyes on Jesus. And that's what the author of Hebrews says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, according to shame, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. We cannot live in the glory days of the past, even though we all want to. The past is the past. It's done. We can't change anything about it. It's already done. We have to strain towards the future. But as we're straining towards the future, we're resting upon the foundation that is Jesus. We don't need to know the outcome of the future. We don't need to know what tomorrow brings. Because Jesus is there. Jesus has it all together. You know, there's guys I follow online on social media, and every time, uh, he'll do it once a week, but he'll always tweet this. And it's usually around the weekend, maybe the first of the week, he says, rest well, my friends, he holds it all together. And man, I love that. I see it all the time. I'm like, that's so good. Because isn't it true? We don't have to worry about what tomorrow brings. Just rest well because he holds it all together. As the body of Christ, we should hold fast to what we have been taught, what we know, and not be unwavering in our devotion to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to press on towards the goal of the upward call of Christ Jesus, no matter what life may throw at us. And that's hard sometimes because we go through times where there is a lot of uncertainty and it's very frustrating. Very frustrating. Because we pray to God and we cry out to God and he doesn't answer. We're just like, what the heck is going on? Why aren't you doing that? What, what, what's going on here? And guess what? You're not alone because a lot of the heroes of the faith that we read about in Scripture felt the same way we did. Felt the same way we all do. But here's what they did. When they felt in those moments when, this, when God was so silent that almost the silence was deafening, they remembered what God had done. It wasn't that they God revealed them what he was going to do. He reminded them of what he had already done. Because he'd say, remember, I brought you out of Egypt. Remember, I brought you into the promised land. What does he tell us today? Remember Jesus on the cross. Remember Jesus on the cross. We can press on because of Jesus. Last thing we'll look at is this idea of standing firm. So if we can press on as we're going through this life, let us stand firm because there's going to be times where we need to. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, going into chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and I'll tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their, destin their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Paul gave this final warning about these false teachers, and he said, Look, don't listen to them and don't worry about them because their destiny is destruction. 
They're going to keep doing this. If they don't give their lives to Jesus, they don't turn to Jesus. That's where their destiny lies. Don't worry about them. Ignore them. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. These false teachers were more concerned over circumcision and what foods you could eat or not eat than surrendering to Jesus. And Paul gave the Philippians this encouragement. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we belong. We belong where God is. We're passing through. We're in the wilderness wanderings as, the, as our ancient ancestors, the Israelites, went through after Egypt. We're in the wilderness wanderings right now. But guess what? The end of the wilderness is what? The promised land. And that's a promised land that's better than the one the Israelites experienced because that's a promised land that will last forever. And we can be easily distracted by false teachers today because they're alive and well, even found in the church. And if you're, focused, if you're listening to a teacher that focuses more on material blessings, I've listened to some of these guys and I'm like, man, I've been, I've been, I can listen to you for 10 minutes and never hear you say Jesus, sin, the gospel, anything. If you're listening to somebody who focuses on more material blessings from God rather than Jesus himself, stop listening and never go back. If a teacher encourages you to gratify the flesh rather than submit to Christ, stop listening and never go back. Ephesians chapter four, verse or chapter six, verse fourteen, Paul says this to the Ephesian church. says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Stand firm then with the belt of truth. What's the belt of truth? It's the gospel. It's the word of God. We stand upon that. That's what holds us up. That's what helps us to stand firm with that belt of truth. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus enough for you? That's the question we should constantly ask ourselves, especially in our day and age, because the false teachers love to preach Jesus and. Jesus and. And you just fill in the blank. Give your life to Jesus and he will give you a mansion. Give your life to Jesus and he'll give you lots of money. Give your life to Jesus and he will heal all your diseases. Can Jesus heal? Absolutely. Can Jesus bless? Of course. But I just like to, I, maybe I'm too simple, but I like to say, just give me Jesus and that's it. If, ever, if I get everything, if I get other stuff, great. But just give me Jesus. That's all I care about. According to Paul, Jesus is enough. He said, well, don't focus on this other stuff. Jesus is enough. We need to stand firm in the truth that Jesus is always enough. And remember, Paul is writing this letter sitting in chains. He is never going to be free again. We know the end of his story. He would never get out of those chains. And yeah, he would interact with Caesar, Emperor Nero. But that interaction didn't go Paul's way. Because Paul's life was ended by Emperor Nero for the sake of the gospel. But if, if we could talk to Paul, if Paul could stand here today, and we could talk to him, and we could interview him and ask him, Paul, if you could go back and redo anything, would you redo it? And I guarantee you would say, absolutely not, why would I? But Paul, your life was taken from you. You could have lived a much longer life and, and, and led more people to Jesus and experienced more of life. And, and I guarantee Paul would say, yeah, but Jesus was enough. Jesus was not the day I, I guarantee you probably say, when the day I met Jesus, I was good. Because whatever else happened was just a bonus. Every day was just a bonus. Because I had met everything that I was looking for in 
of Jesus. We got to ask ourselves, is that our attitude? Is that how we view things? If everything is taken away, is Jesus enough for us? So in closing, let's be like Paul and see everything, all these accomplishments, all this resume that we may try to build up. Let's see it as like, no, that's loss. That's garbage compared to Christ. It's nothing. It's worthless. If it gets thrown away, if it gets burned up, if it gets destroyed, so be it, as long as we still have Jesus. And we can press on on that foundation. Because if we build our, our, our foundation upon the things of this world, remember, all that stuff equals zero. It's fragile. It doesn't hold us up. You think it does, but it doesn't. It's like doing those, like, you ever do one of those trust falls? You know, your friends are supposed to stand behind you and hold their arms like this and say, we got you, you know, you're supposed to do this and just fall backwards. Those are always fun, right? That's like a youth group thing. All right, let's do a trust fall, guys. Guarantee somebody's going to fall and bust their head, okay? But that's how we are if we try to say, oh, you know what, Jesus, I'll just take the world because it'll catch me. Guess what? It ain't going to catch you. It's not going to catch you. The foundation isn't strong enough. Jesus is. And let us stand firm. Stand firm in the truth that we know by the gospel. Because that's gonna, what's going to last forever. Jesus said, this world may pass away, but my words won't. And why won't his words pass away? Because it came from his mouth. He is the eternal one. As scripture tells us, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not change. Amen? Amen. Amen. Close out our service today. We're going to do...